Hello, um, welcome, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Heather Grant. I'm one of the community admins at the Maintenance Community by Upkeep. Welcome back if this is uh, not your first time here and welcome if this is your first webinar with us. I would appreciate you all making the time to be with us today. Uh, if you are not already a member of our Maintenance Community Slack group, we would love to have you join us. I will drop the link in the chat to sign up in just a moment. Today we have Ricky Smith joining for a presentation on how to optimize your current preventive maintenance program. The recording from our session today will be available at this link right after we end and in the maintenance community on Slack tomorrow, along with a copy of the slides that you see here today. Ricky is also available to answer questions live in the Slack group, so please feel free to share the recording of this webinar or the invitation to Slack directly with any friends, colleagues, um, or anyone else you know who would benefit from hearing some of Ricky's expertise. Before we get started, uh, I want to share with you how to ask and answer questions as we go through the uh, presentation today. So you'll use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to ask any questions as they come up uh, or answer any questions that Ricky may ask to you. Um, using that chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of our session today, answering as many questions as we can, but anything we don't get to, we will answer offline. Um, again, please feel free to ask away in the chat there and we will go through those at the end of our session. That is all from me. Um, thank you again, Ricky and everyone for joining us today. And Ricky, I will turn it over to you to kick us off. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, hope you're having a great day or great evening, depending on where you are in the world. So this whole thing about how to optimize your current preventive maintenance program, it, it, uh, it took a lot of thinking on my part because it's not just P, it's not PM optimization. It's how do I optimize my preventive maintenance program? That's what this is about, your total program. I've got a few questions for you, okay? Pre-test, okay? What is preventive maintenance, okay? So text in, what do you, what do you, what's your definition of preventive maintenance? We have the response time-based tasks. Okay, that's good. Some other people are typing. Another for time-based maintenance. Okay. Any planned maintenance activity? All right. I saw a couple more people typing. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, what our definition? We really are, uh, we've got everybody's opinion on what something is. All right. I'll move to the next question. How would you measure if a PM or PMs or your PMs are effective or not? How would you measure that? How do you how do you know your PMs are effective? Might be a better question. If your downtime is lower. Yeah, I would expect that. That's a good point. Less reactive maintenance, guest complaints. Yeah. How much rework you do. Rework. Ah, I like that. I like that. Most it's people don't know expected. rework. Yeah. All right, Another let's go to the next question. What is maintenance planning? A detailed description of a repair. Yeah, good, good one. Extending the life cycle of your assets. Mm -hmm. okay. Maintenance work scope determination. And it's part of it for sure. A couple more typing. Um, the intervals needed of PM per equipment or equipment type. Maintenance okay. scope and resources determination. Yeah, maintenance planning is the, is the scoping of the work, planning the job, and the next function is scheduling. So it's good, good question. The PM question I ask about PM effective or not. One of the things I like I used to use was PM labor hours versus emergency and urgent labor hours. That told me if 
you know, if emergency labor hours going up and my PM labor hours are steady, something's wrong. Something's wrong. All right, let's move on. So what is what is scheduling? What is maintenance scheduling? That's maintenance planning. Now, what's the main? What is maintenance scheduling? Two different functions. When will we do the job that is already planned? Yep. It's to schedule work by day, by hour. And the work should have a job plan package of everything in it. Most of this work comes from PMs and PDMs and predictive maintenance. All right. So what is, what is production's role in preventive maintenance? What do you think it is? What is it in your organization? Don't say tear up equipment. I know they do that, but that's okay. Just kidding. Okay. What is production's role in preventive maintenance? Allowing time to do the PMs, reporting anomalies. Both of those are very good, very good ones. Uh, to run it on autopilot for better planning. Yeah. So what is the PF curve and how does it affect preventive maintenance? Um, the potential failures beginning point, yeah. how to make the right repairs at the right time. Yeah. Good, great point. That's a good one. So what, what is a gimbal wall? I threw a curve on you on this one. Come on, I got some lean people out there. Tell me what it is. going into the work time, where the work is, idle time. It's observing the work, right? You're walking around just observing what's going on. And in preventive maintenance, if you walk around and see what, a, what when we perform preventive maintenance, what, what do we see? A lot of times in preventive maintenance, we'll see some inaccuracies or some problems that could help us. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. Should operators be involved in visual inspection of their equipment while running? Yes, 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 all yeses. I hope so. Okay, the PF curve and preventing maintenance. Okay, what is the PF curve? It's just a graphical representation of how something fails. So if we look at this, there's a PF curve below us. We have the conditional probability of failure. So, and then we have time, okay? So as we move along, if failure starts, we have a potential failure. This is where the failure becomes detectable. Okay, so this potential failure, what we do then, what we do from there on determines if we're going to succeed or not. All right. And then, so the old definition of failure, if we go all the way to the bottom, is equipment broken. Okay. So preventive maintenance falls between this arrow. Think about in preventive maintenance, what, what we do. PM inspection identifies the defects once failure begins. How far back can it do on the PF curve? That's a good question. You know, and that's that's the inspection part of preventive maintenance. And then lubrication prevents the start of failure. Now, if we if we lubricate properly with hydraulics or grease or whatever we're using, you know, we can stop, we can prevent the start of the failure on the PF curve. And adjustments keep the equipment functioning into specification. Again, it mitigates the failure by making adjustments accordingly. And that's why preventive maintenance is inspect, adjust, lubricate. All right, so preventive maintenance is a controlled experiment. So if we, we perform specific tasks like inspect, adjust, lubricate to ensure the assets meet the intent of the asset owners. Now you see the one on the right, I guarantee you they're doing a great PM program on that one, on that GTO. The one on the left, okay, that GTO, I just like some plants equipment when I go into, I, I'm just kidding. Okay. Maybe not quite that bad, but pretty bad sometimes. Okay. So what are some root causes of PM failures? This is something I, 
created a long time ago called warning only permanent repairs made here so when a, when a company puts their equipment in a controlled state where it's maintainable then we put a sign up you know only warning only permanent repairs made here so that way it catches them in the eye when they walk into on that production line or a production area saying hey we maintain our equipment here so a few of the most common reasons that a plant does not follow best maintenance repair practices are maintenance personnel not provided the time to perform repairs the specification how much long is it going to take planning and scheduling is not effective or exists in a proactive state repeatable procedures are not in place to ensure lessons learned from failures are used to optimize asset reliability and the old oh the one that is probably true than any of them is maintenance is reactive does not follow the definition of maintenance which is to pr protect preserve and prevent from failure decline the reactive culture management is not supported does not understand the consequences following best practices real understanding must involve knowledge of how much money is lost it to the bottom line and that's what you got to talk to management about is the money maintenance personnel do not have the requisite skills that many times that is a problem but most time it's not your maintenance workforce lacks either discipline or direction to follow best maintenance repair practices so lubrication is critical to best maintenance repair practice preventive maintenance is critical to it so lack of knowledge of maintenance best practice results in equipment failure you know, I always say definition of the critical so everyone can speak the same language. You know, an example, inspect chain drive, okay? So that's an example. So reactive definition be execute the task based on what is written on the PM work order. Example, check chain drive. This statement leaves the specifications up to the imagination of the maintenance technician. How many of you ha have seen this before? Come on, text him. If you've seen something like this, something so simple, inspect chain drive, but no, no, no definition behind it saying what it is, what's good, what's bad. Uh, we have all the time, many. Most of the work orders are like this. Yeah, that's the problem. It's a problem for sure. I'm glad you're on this on this show in this uh, program, this webinar today. Proactive definition: execute the PM to specification, following the step-by-step instructions and specifications as stated on. The That's the proactive definition, right? Example: check chain drive for the following. Identify chain sag. Specification: one inch max on the chain sag. Okay. Then inspect sprocket alignment specification align parallel and axle. So angle alignment, no deviation. We want it. We want it perfectly aligned with those. If we don't, we get failure. Let's talk about human error. Human error. We must accept human error as an ine as inevitable and design around that fact. This was the. This was a philosopher Donald Berwick, I mean, he made this statement and I like it a lot. We must accept human error as inevitable. In other words, it's gonna happen, but we must design around the fact. And, and PM is no different. That's why I believe it's step-by-step -step instructions, you know, follow each step. And what I like, what I used to do with my technicians is each step they did, they put their initials beside it. That way they didn't miss a step. So, could human error impact PM effectiveness? Absolutely. So this was this was created by Dr. Er Kerwin. And uh, what he found was that if we look at the very, let's start at the very bottom, okay? Human performance lane, team of operators performing a well-designed task. We could say a team of mechanics performing a well-designed task like preventive maintenance. All the way up to the top where the generated general rate of errors involving very high stress level job that's reactive maintenance so what how how much difference is this is thousands of times difference it is unbelievable what when we have this so 70 80 percent of failures are caused by human error that's why in preventive maintenance we need those step-by-step -step instructions okay so what is preventive maintenance without a definition we have someone's opinion I, Every company I work with, I, I always recommend have the same, have a definition for every term that we use in maintenance 
so everyone understands it and follows it. So here's the source of this one came from SMRP, Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professionals. If you're a member of it, you can download these in their SMRP best practices, or SMRP metrics manuals, and they're great to use for things like this. And you can modify them to fit what your definition is. When I was a maintenance manager, I had a, we had everything we did, we had definitions for them. My maintenance techs helped create that. So PM is actions performed on a time or machine run based schedule that detect, preclude, or mitigate degradation of a component or system where the aim of sustaining or extending its useful life through control and degrade, degradation to an acceptable level. Wow. Preventative maintenance sustains equipment reliability through lubrication, inspecting for defects, and making adjustments as needed. And prevent a maintenance of the regular routine maintenance of equipment and assets in order to keep them running and prevent any uncost any costly unplanned downtime from unexpected equipment failure. And then preventive maintenance enables a successful maintenance strategy, planning and scheduling maintenance of equipment before a problem occurs. The whole thing about preventive maintenance, we had detect a defect ahead of time with preventive maintenance. So we mitigate a defect, okay? then if we have to, if we detect one, then we can plan it and schedule it. Hopefully if we catch it far enough up on the PF curve that we have time to plan it, schedule it, execute it before it fails. I always say this, insanity. Perform preventive maintenance on equipment that continues to break down. It's, it's not logical. Think about it, it's not logical. But why are we doing preventive maintenance on equipment that continues to break down? We need to find out what the root cause of the problem is, right? So let's look at some world-class maintenance versus typical attributes, okay? So maintenance cost is a percentage of replacement asset value, typical maintenance 5.6 to 11%, world-class maintenance 2 to 2.5%. Now these maintenance costs is a percentage of replacement asset value. Everybody asks me, how do I measure that? Well, I tell you, what, what it says is, what is your maintenance cost versus what is the replacement? If you had to replace the factory, you know, outside the grounds, everything, all the equipment inside, what would that maintenance cost be as a percentage of that replacement asset value? And I can tell you, you're not going to get that. What I do, the companies I work with, we usually get the assured value with the site and we use that just to baseline, are we improving or not? So where we stand with typical world-class doesn't matter. All I'm trying to show you is that world-class is a lot cheaper. We have less cost than we have when we're reactive or typical. Budget compliance, less than 60%, okay? So budget compliance here, world-class maintenance, 100%. And if say 100, I mean, when I worked at a world-class plant, I'll call Mount Holly, we were sometimes hitting 90%, but that was the lowest I'd ever seen it. Planners per craft person, no planner, typical maintenance or no proactive planning process. World-class maintenance, we got one planner per 20 craftsmen. Absenteeism, high. Typical maintenance is, is high. World class plus or minus 5%. PM compliance, 60% typical. World class, 95 to 100%. Maintenance rework, typical maintenance is high. World class maintenance is low. So why would you, why should you optimize your current PM program? Well, to optimize equipment reliability through early detection or detection of defects. Sorry about that. My bad. To prevent equipment failure through PM inspections, adjustments, and lubrication. So if we're going to optimize PM, we need to make sure what we're doing, that we're doing it the right way. And we record it to reduce maintenance costs. I mentioned earlier. Okay. There's another number. This came from Alcoa Mount Holly. This, this was John Day who, who created a world-class maintenance model. And what he found with all the plants that came to look at his plant, and I worked there at the time. And a lot of companies came in with a lot of people and uh, tried to take notes about how they were doing it. But maintenance cost was lower than most companies in the world. There's still some companies that are doing extraordinarily well. Maintenance material cost, the same thing. So which step in the, mo in the proactive maintenance process is the most critical? Well, across the bottom, we got time. Okay, at some point, so we, we have our PM, so we do an inspection, we do our lubrication and maybe adjustment. And then from that, okay, so we take a weekly schedule, all right? We perform the PM. We have the results from the PM. 
And sometimes we have a work request and we have planning, planning and kits to parts, pulls, has them pulled from the warehouse. And oh yeah, we, oh, that's right. We got break-ins too. So emergency work orders may move this over. So this should be something that we call unacceptable. So an event is a breakdown or problem that does not involve the planner. If one of the things I say about a planner, if you want to know if you got a proactive planner, call them on the phone and say, Hey, I need a part right now. The next thing you hear is a dial tone. You got a proactive planner. Okay. So after we plan it, we get our, all our work. So our preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance, we go into coordination meeting. We coordinate day by day. Who's going to do, you know, what work was going to be done, what equipment, when it's going to be down and so on. We publish the schedule. We execute the work. We have equipment history. Then we can evolve our PM program. So we should look at failures and look at our PM program and say, what's going on? What's wrong? So the results, performance of specification, maintain capacity, and continuous improvement. So why preventive maintenance does not meet expectation? No one knows what known best maintenance best practices look like. Because it isn't just preventive maintenance. It's the whole process. The true value of preventive maintenance is not seen by management. They say, hey, let's get those PMs done. Preventive maintenance inspections are not repeatable. You know, if you give it to five maintenance people and to lubricate a bearing, they'll lubricate it a different way if they don't have step-by-step -step instructions. PM compliance is 100%, but equipment problems continue. I don't know how many places I go to. <laughs> and they say, oh, well, our PM compliance is 100%. And I'm asking them, so, so you have problems? Oh, yeah, we got problems all the time. How can you have PM compliance 100% and you, you still have equipment problems? That's, it's not logical. The only metric to manage PMs is PM compliance. It's the only thing a lot of plants do, they measure PM compliance. How do you measure PMs? How, if your PMs are effective at night, uh, PM compliance. Okay, okay. Missed the whole question. Equipment is not in a maintainable condition. You cannot perform preventive maintenance on equipment that is not at a maintainable level. You have to step back and say, I need to restore this asset to a maintainable level. Remember that picture of that GTO, the old beat up one and, and the one that was restored? That's what we got to do with equipment. We got to bring it from a, from a reactive state to a proactive state and a maintainable condition. Operators not, are not involved in preventive maintenance. Why, why aren't they not involved? You know, they can hear stuff, they can smell stuff, we can put targets on things for them to see and say, okay, okay, I see, it looks like that chain is moving, sagging, you know, so much of deflection. I got it marked behind the expanded metal screen. If it drops below that, then I'll write a work order to come in and change the chain. By the way, you never put a half link on a chain drive, never. If you do, it's because you're patching it and you're going to have to write a corrective work order to come back and replace the whole chain. Because when chains stretch, Okay, and you put a half link in it, then what you do is you've got one link, okay, that's going to be different pitch diameter than the others. And it's going to start riding up on the sprocket more and more. Operator care, you know, it has a role to play in sharing the responsibility for condition, performance of machinery and equipment, and also by improving machinery condition, which ha will have an effect, with no doubt, of considering reducing the number of failures and stoppages. You notice the picture down below. It's the handshake. We're going to do the best we can this week to keep equipment running well. Operator care will bring about change in traditional attitude of, you know, I operate the machinery, you fix it. By promoting a local team and making the maintenance of machinery condition everyone's responsibility. That's why I like a RACI chart for roles and responsibilities. Some of you have seen some of my webinars or been to some of my training. I, I push this hard, having defined roles and responsibilities by all stakeholders. Operator care is an approach that enables traditional maintenance practices to change from reactive to proactive by sharing responsibility for machinery condition, performance, and maintenance. And operator care also provides several mechanisms whereby breakdowns and stoppages are analyzed that causes an investigative action taken to prevent further problems. As part of the root cause analysis, operators can get involved in that. Preventive maintenance plus operator care equals optimal asset reliability at optimal cost. Guarantee you. So the fundamentals of effective PMs, all equipment PMs are focused on specific failure modes. Okay, failure modes are how something fails. All PM procedures should have the following step-by-step -step instructions on what initial on each step. 
specifications. If it's warranted, they may not be a specification. I've seen some people, they use pictures on it, and you just put an X on what you see. Space available for extra information. Condition is found. Condition is left. Oh, recommend, recommendation of changes to the PM procedure. Ah, that's a good one. I like that one a lot. By the way, I have a, a work order template. You know, it's a word, but it's it's editable. So you can edit to, pick, to fit your needs. And if you want it at the end, you see my email address. You send it to me and I'll be glad to share it with you. By the way, if you send me an email, I don't capture your email addresses. Sorry, but I don't. I don't need your email address. Only I want to do is send you back the information you need. So recommended changes to procedure. When a PM work order is given to maintenance text, the following should be attached. Equipment history, failure history since the last PM was executed. That's important. Thank you. I want to give the text, you know, the work order history since the last PM was executed. Would that help them? Now, I want to, I'm going to ask you in the chat, tell me yes or no if you think this would help you right now. We have all yeses so far. It's the only way to know if we're doing the right inspections. Yeah. And yeses, more yeses. Yeah. I tell you what, I learned this at a plant. It's what's great when you travel and meet a lot of plants, go to a lot of plants, you meet and learn a lot of things. No matter how bad a plant may be, you always learn something there. They always have something, some you know, golden nugget there that I'm trying to find while I'm there. So if equipment fails between PM cycles, you know, and root cause analysis should be initiated. It could be just a five wise. Why did it fail? Well, it failed because, you know, Jimmy over there put a chain on. Well, <laughs> why, did, why did Jimmy put a chain on? He's not even competent to do it. Oh, let's forget it. You see what I'm talking about. Follow, you know, post the following metric in the maintenance shop on the line graph. PM labor hours versus emergency urgent labor hours. So you notice my PM labor hours are fairly stable but my urgent emergency labor hours are out of control. And this is just an example of from the Hawthorne effect. You know, the Hawthorne effect is if you show something, something to people, you can change their behavior based on what they see. So it's for the behavior change in, in PM using this metric PM versus emergency urgent labor hours. So prevent and maintenance process. So this is the PM continuous improvement loop. So PM is a plan and schedule. We execute the PMs, the corrective work identified from PM. Okay, so we identified work from the PM. That's correct. It means we, now we can plan and schedule it. We executed the specification. The work order is closed. And now our PMs are evaluated and optimized based on the PM metric. So what all this information, every step in this process is critical. What was ultimately is critical is having data to tell us, are, are my processes working effectively? Do PMs need to be rewritten? If they do, we rewrite them. The worst thing can happen with a PM, we go back and we have to we have to rewrite the PM, okay? And if no, the PM doesn't need to be rewritten, then we, it goes back into continuous improvement loop, okay? So yes, so on. So why... What to do if prevent and maintenance is not meeting expectation? Knowledge you have a problem with your PM program not meeting expect, expectation. You got to admit it first. Most companies I go to, I, I can tell you, you know, unless you're you're somebody like a water bottler or oil company or something, you know, your PMs are probably fairly good. But a lot of companies, it's, it's difficult. So first, you got to acknowledge you got a problem. All right, that's the first thing. Then you got to, then I would assemble a team of maintenance techs, maintenance supervisor and operators. To, I'd call it the POT team, the PM optimization team of, of P, PMOT, you know, whatever you want to call it, establish your vision, mission, guiding principles approved by maintenance, production and plant leadership and meet weekly for three minutes max. So identify the equipment that has the most losses, OEE, production loss, emergency urgent labor hours, et cetera. However you want to measure where do we start? Where do we go after first, second, third? Post a score, a dashboard to measure progress and measure the effectiveness of this program. Need help with a dashboard? I'd be glad to help you with it. Create a PM problem solutions board using an A3 approach to problem solving. 
you know, and this A3 approach is just a simple approach. You know, what's the problem? What was the root cause? What's the resolution? How do we measure and sustain it? Okay, that's all that is. So why is the A3 used to visually improve visibility of PM issues? Now, yeah. A3 is a structured problem solving and continuous improvement approach first employed by at Toyota and typically used by lean manufacturing technique tech practitioners, okay? It provides a simple and strict approach systematically leading toward problem solving over structured approaches. So we got the business case, you know, what is the issue, a problem we need to solve? Why is this issue important to solve now? What are the benefits, you know, the stakeholders? Who's involved in it? maintenance, production, whoever that is? What's the current state? Where are we? You know, what's the current condition? What are the trends? What's the data? Analysis of root causes. What's the root causes of this problem? And then solutions. What, what solutions are best we should recommend? You know, which one can give us the, the quick wins and which ones we need to have for sustainment, okay? And then we have action items. We, we put a put a chart together and we say, okay, what are the tasks? And, and when it says owner, that in the racy chart, that's accountable. That means the buck stops here. I'd want to have responsible with that too, who's the doer, who's going to do it? And then the metrics. How are we going to measure if the PMs are effective or not? How are we going to measure? All right. So I showed you this earlier. So it's the example. This one, was, this is a true actual issue that was at a plant. Problem, gearbox failure. Asset criticality was high. Production losses, 330 units. Okay. Four hours of downtime, $7,450. That's how much it cost them in production losses. Bottom line. Root cause, known gearbox noise. A noise of the gearbox now. P reported on daily checklist for two weeks. Production needed to run, could not take downtime to replace gearbox. Anybody ever seen one like this before? Text it in if you have. Not, it may not be a gearbox, but something that you keep telling production, and, but they're not listening to you. All the time yesterday <laughs> yesterday i like that but think about this the resolution now we replaced the gearbox the specification we sent the gearbox out for rebuilding forensics identified the root cause why it failed the replaced parts so in other words the fact the gearbox parts that were replaced they were returned so all the maintenance techs could, could look at it and what this maintenance manager did with Whoever could come up with a true root cause of why the gearbox failed first, you know, them and their wife would, or spouse, get, you know, dinner at whatever restaurant downtown. Review all PM frequencies on gearbox. Review past all sample results. What? How do we miss this? You know, cost of gearbox replacement, labor $200. You know, the gearbox was $800. So that that's $1,000. See, let me think. We lost four hours of downtime, 7450 And over here, the cost to do it right was going to cost, it cost us 1000 Come on. So how do we now measure and sustain it? PM compliant using 10% of the time frequency of critical assets. What does that mean? Just say a monthly PM. Okay, so it isn't, on this, on this specific one right here, since it's a critical asset, I'd say we're going to do it within three days. So just take a monthly average 30 days. 10% rule, three days of doing it, you're out of compliance. Not everything, just on that critical asset. Then I want to know the oil sample time from sample taken to results received, review measured. If free sample required three days to resample, out of spec, corrective work order written, replacement planned and scheduled. That's what we want to see. Preventive maintenance, if we take an oil sample, we find out something from the oil sample. Now, really, oil sample is not preventive maintenance. That's really predictive maintenance. But if we detect it, then we should go ahead and write a corrective work order to replace it, at least plan it right now. We may not schedule it because we may not have the opportunity. But if it does fail prematurely, we got the gearbox, we got the parts, we got the work order with the procedures and so on. So PM practice knowledge sharing, best practice knowledge sharing, making knowledge sharing a priority. It's big. Information to identify information will get the audience's attention. This is a this is a toolbox talk. If you go to my website at worldclassmaintenance.org, 
You can download all my toolbox talks or single point lessons that I have. I'm trying to be politically correct. So I'm changing it to single point lessons. Okay. So toolbox talk, post a toolbox talk in the maintenance shop to begin with. When someone don't, don't talk to anybody about it. when someone asks, what is this all about? Tell them that we'll discuss it at next, discuss it next week. If you want to get their attention first, that's what you're trying to do. Get their attention. Let rumors perk people's interest. The following week, host a 15-minute training session on Toolbox Talk 101. Talk about what is preventive maintenance. Give each attendee a copy of the Toolbox Talk, and then everyone give everyone 10 minutes to read it before we discuss it. And then go through the Toolbox Talk step by step, asking questions and specific topics, ideas you want feedback engagement with. Then ask the group at the end. If you have any ideas or concepts in this toolbox, talks could be implemented. And if so, how, how do we do it? Implement recommendations and measure effectiveness. You know, PM labor hours versus emergency urgent labor hours. A number of corrective work orders from PMs last week. That's a big deal too, knowing how many come from it. Now, Heather, it sounds sound like we got a few questions. What, what do we have? Um, hello. There are a couple of questions. Let me scroll back. Sorry, they, they got mixed up in these responses to your questions. Um, one question I saw, I'm trying to find it, I just wanted to know, uh, says, do we need to do PMO study for production on critical assets or for all of our assets? Um, say that one more time. Sure. sure. Um, do we need to do PMO study for the production critical assets or for all of the assets? All assets. But it's going to be based on asset criticality, which ones you write PMs on first or, or you ask for operators to get involved in the PM. I start on the most critical assets first if you don't have them right now. All right. Another question? Another one says, uh, there are many failures in our CMMS history for which we have no preventive or PDM. How do we overcome this issue? Just go back to work and start tomorrow. Start creating PNs and put them in the system. You know, you're not alone. There's a lot of companies that, that struggle with this, but you got to make it a priority. You know, it's, it's maybe, you know, whoever's whoever's being pushed is pushing back on this next week, Tuesday through Thursday. I got PM best practices workshop. It's going to be virtual on Zoom, just like this, but you're going to see faces. Okay, so be a little different technology here. But um, that would be a good one to get them to understand. So three days, not a one hour session, okay? Mm -hmm. So how do you use a toolbox talk for PM? So I'm gonna do a role play, okay? So the class will be my maintenance technicians, instructor will be, I'll be your maintenance supervisor. So all attendees, please look at the toolbox talk of preventive maintenance 101, which I've sent to you in a text. You should have this toolbox talk in your text. Am I right, Heather? Uh, no, we just have the matrix. Just the matrix? Okay, never mind. I can find you know, it. All attendees. So here, if I'm going to do it with my with my technicians, all attendees will role play, you know. So if we, we do, do it here as a maintenance tech, okay. So here, preventive maintenance. What is preventive maintenance? So we start off with the definition of what it is. Then we talk about the fundamentals of PM. All equipment PMs focus on specific failure modes. All PM procedures should have the following step-by-step -step instructions for people initial each step. Specification is specifications are required. Space available for extra information. Condition is found, condition is left. Recommendation to changes to the procedure. When a PM work order is given to maintenance tech, the following should be attached. I already mentioned this. Equipment failure history since last PM executed. If a PM if a piece of critical equipment fails between PM cycles, an RCA should be initiated. Don't waste time. Post this metric I mentioned in in the uh, in your in your maintenance shop. So step one, you know, acknowledge you got a problem. Create two. Step two, create a pot team or PM optimization team. You need your vision and mission guiding principles. Identify the equipment experience and the most problems. And then implement the PM optimization first, PM optimization process on the first asset. And then post a dashboard and measure progress. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. Okay. Very simple. 
So some problems in solutions, and maintenance, inspections. So our PM activities, we got inspection, we got lubrication, we got time-based change out in operator care. So with our metrics for inspection is PM effectors, mean time between failure day offset. Okay. Lubrication, PM compliance using a 10% rule. I also like that inspection too. I'm just trying to give you a little bit more opportunity to think different. Time-based change out, schedule compliance by day by hour. Operator care, PM compliance by shift, PM effectiveness. Those are the metrics, okay? Possible problem with the inspection. PM's not focused on failure modes, ineffective measurements, no step-by-step -step procedures. In other words, we're leaving it to each human to decide how they want to do it. No verification if PM has completed a specification. Personnel not following procedure. And, and you see what I'm talking about, all the different issues that we have, possible problems, and then we got to find a solution for it. So for the PM effectiveness to improve that, engage maintenance techs in evaluating PMs. We just talked about that. And the PM labor hours versus emergency labor hour. Lubrication determine the type and amount of grease required. Now, this is something a lot of people miss on this, the amount of grease. We probably have different types of grease guns. They may look similar, but a one pump of grease, is that one gram or is it five grams? You can over lubricate or under lubricate. You need to know what that is. You need to know how much grease that bearing is supposed to have in it. SKF will give you that information or whoever you, your bearings are from. They will give you that information based on RPMs and load and so on. Then the planning and scheduling training for planners and our leadership. And then measure effectiveness of PM compliance of operator care. I want operator care to have a PM compliance too. I learned that from automotive plant I worked with. It was amazing what they were doing with it. So here's them leading lagging KPIs. And we're looking at PM activities, inspection, leading KPI. Leading KPIs lead to results. Lagging KPIs are the results. And you notice at the top, I said insanity, performing preventive maintenance on equipment continues to break down. It's not logical. So we got PM activities, leading, lagging, inspection. So PM compliance, if we're, if we're meeting PM compliance, then our maintenance costs should have showed that. Production, line, production downtime should show that. So PM compliance impacts maintenance costs and production downtime. Lubrication, again, PM compliance, and again, maintenance costs and production downtime. Time-based change out. Schedule compliance, okay? So this is not this is not necessarily a PM as much as schedule, because when we schedule it, okay, we want to make sure we do it on time, especially if it's time based. Maintenance cost, production, downtime, and then operator care. You know whether you got PM compliance or not. So question marks. You know maintenance cost and production downtime. So the top four reasons why you want to conduct a PM evaluation. Number one. Never thought about the impact a PM evaluation would make on equipment problems and failures, production throughput, safety, environmental, maintenance costs, and production throughput. Reason two, free up maintenance staff to perform proactive work. If you know, we got to have you know, if we if our PM is effective, we got more maintenance staff then instead of running around chasing fires, we have more maintenance staff to do the right work at the right time. Then operator care, take it to the next level. Operators take pride in operating their equipment and specification. Operator stress go down, you know. Operators inspect items which can cause process and asset failures. What I did with one plant, we went around and we put targets on certain things they had to look at. Like it had a big yellow circle and it had a big one on it, okay. So the operator would look at, you know, they had a handheld PDA. They look at a handheld PDA and said one, and they told them what they need to be looking at and then punch in what they see, okay? To reduce costs and assure viability of a plant or site. Total product, production and maintenance costs for the site will be reduced through reduction of equipment failures. And we already talked about the preventive maintenance, stat, preventive maintenance um, definition with SMRP. PM optimization process, you know, identify an asset, a functional area to PM to be executed. Identify cross-functional team. We want operator maintenance. Don't try to take on the whole plant with PM optimization. Reliability engineer, maintenance planner, establish expectations for everyone engaged in the process. 
define the end goal of the process. What do you what do you want out of this PM optimization equipment to run better, less troubleshooting, less less problems? Define how you measure if the PM optimization is effective or not. Present copies of the PMs to all parties. Review the equipment history for the last 30, 60, 180 days. Number of breakdowns, causes of critical breakdowns based on former RCA, PM labor hours versus emergency urgent labor hour. Go step by step with each PM procedure and identify the following for each, okay? So here are the PM evaluation recommendations. There, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, no value, delete tasks, reassign the lube route, reassign the operator care. The operator's already there. Why we got a maintenance technician doing the job? Replace with PDM. If they're gonna do PDM inspection on it, why can't they do the visual inspection on it at the same time? Rewrite the task. In other words, it's, it's, it's good, but we need to write it with clear to the maintenance text. And then tasks as good as found. So here's the number of tasks, a lot of tasks, a lot of tasks. This is actually a true event, okay, that I did at a, at a plant. Total number of tasks and percentage of the total of 100. Labor hours represented. You know, I, I tell you, once we did this, it has freed up so many maintenance people to do other things. Then they had three reliability engineers were going crazy. They finally brought calm to the plant. So how to optimize it, provide training and maintenance best practices, you know, for production leadership, one hour maintenance leadership, four hour maintenance techs, three days. Reason, we want everyone aligned. We want alignment of everyone. Identified area having the most problems. Most breaks at a maintenance schedule, not meeting problem, you know, the production goals, number of most urgent emergency labor hours, highest total cost, establish the baseline based on the average of the last 12 months of data using the following recommendations below. I went to average, okay, PM compliance. So this is gonna set a baseline when we start optimizing the PM program. Emergency labor hours, maintenance material costs, maintenance labor costs, schedule compliance. Oh, we, we should see these changing and they're probably going to change in a negative to start with, and then they'll get better because everything gets worse at first before it starts to improve. So we're paying attention to it. Perform a PM act optimization on the worst performing asset. Then template the results across like equipment. If you got the same type of equipment in your plant, when you do it on one, you do it on all of them. You template it across. So create an SOP for PM procedures. Okay, it's important to have, you know, that you have SOP for PM procedures. So here I've got one, it's, you got equipment block ID, equipment hierarchy project. On this one, it says perform PM on SEPTEP process line. So it actually gets down to it. This one is perform PM on hydraulic system. All right, it's monthly, takes two texts, three hours, elapsed times, three hours. Estimated downtime, three hours. The originator, you know, and the owner, Version control, warnings. Warnings have to do with death or serious injury. Cautions have to do with equipment damage. Any personal protective equipment. Why does all this help? Because this, these, these, this information, along with the storeroom information, you know, the part number and all that helps the planner scheduler. And also when you look at consumables, special tools required, any mobile equipment required, record, required departmental, you know, coordination. And then we have our step-by-step -step instructions, okay? And then we estimate how many craft we need, what the clock hours are. Why do we do all that, put that in there? Because at the bottom, will give us the total hours. Now, you notice we got the red lockout, tag out, hydraulic system. That's a warning, caution, failure to clean inside a reservoir, result of premature valve failure. And you know, I got on here, replace filters, replace zinc anode on water cool heat exchanger. Probably nobody ever does that, you know, to take the galvanic corrosion out of the copper tubing. Inspect hydraulic hoses, and you got the numbers on them. They either got a leak or not, aware or not. Is aware on it? Yes or no, okay? Inspect hydraulic cylinder for leaks. Inspect rod seal for leak. No leaks, sweeping oil, oil seam, stream. Inspect rod seal for breaking thread seal. I like to put thread seal on the rod yoke. So if it starts to move a little bit, I can see it because it'll crack. It'll put a crack in it. I used to use my wife's red lacquer fingernail polish. Worked pretty good on that. Inspect all work after production is up to rate. Do not lead equip, leave equipment until production is up to rate. I want the production to give me this before my people leave doing the PM. So condition is found, condition is left, comments or findings. So this is where you put in what you found on the PM for the planner schedule. 
craft feedback on procedures, craft signature. All right. So we continue on. Number eight, step eight. Prevent and maintenance most important routine function that maintenance personnel must accomplish the specification. Nine, prevent and maintenance must meet expectations of production consistently. Optimal process reliability. Ten, operators and maintainers are trained in maintenance best practices. Not just prevent and maintenance, but how does the whole process work? How does PM intertwine with everything else? We must, people need to have the same knowledge so they understand it. PMs are executed to specification. Repeatable PM procedure to use, just like what I just showed you. Like V-belts, okay, as an example. What's the tension? What's the deflection? Is it good or bad? You know, I think that's important. PM inspections are conducted by trained or qualified individuals. But when we had new technicians come to work with us, one of the things we had was called a task qualification. I send you to work with Jimmy. Yep, Jimmy was one of my best technicians. Put him with Jimmy. And once they work with Jimmy on a PM and Jimmy gives him thumbs up, then I check him off on the skills chart. PMs have step-by-step -step instructions. PMs required initial for each step in the PM. PMs are created at the level that any maintenance can perform the specification. You know, one of the failures of PM is having a lengthy sentence, you know, and, and it goes on for three or four lines. Don't waste your time. Noun, adjective, and a verb. That's all you need. You don't need a bunch of junk on there because people aren't going to read it. Admit it. Most PM steps, here you go. PM steps have a noun, adjective, and a verb for each step. Example, check chain drive for deflection attention specification. That's all. Step 12, defects found on PM results. Results in a corrected work order to be planned and scheduled to correct and eliminate the defect. The initial, the inspector's initials are posted after each step. If any equipment does not meet functional requirements set by management, a root cause analysis should be performed. 15. If any equipment does not meet functional requirements set by management and root cause analysis, I just said that. Okay, questions. All right, visit my website. It'll help you out a lot. So answer your questions. This is the web, this is the work workshop I got coming up next week. So go ahead and uh, text in your questions. We got a couple more in. Um a question here, it says, how long does it take to train technicians to understand the flow of PM best knowledge, best practice knowledge sharing? Three days. <laughs> <laughs> right there. I have to tell you, a lot of people come to my class and they don't know why they're there. Management sent them. When they leave, they, they go back and uh, they have a plan. Because I don't let anybody leave the class without a plan. You got to have a plan when you go back. What are you going to do based on what you learned to change the way things are at the plant? Because management spent money on you to go to training, and they expect something from that. Nice. Next question here says, "How do you define PM intervals? Is there a process to identify those intervals?" Yeah, um, it has to do with the meantime between failure. So, if you want the equipment to run out to some time. It's supposed to be that you should inspect, you know, every three times you should find a problem. Not every time. If every time, that means your interval, you know, is, is out of whack. Okay. So if every time you go, you inspect it, that means your interval is out too far. You need to pull it back in. Could you want to be able to find a defect early enough that you can plan and schedule it without interruption to production? It's to prevent, really, um, when we say prevent and maintenance, it's prevent failure. That's what we're trying to do, prevent failure. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a comment here at the end that's similar to what you're saying. It says there's many PM tasks performed for which we've never seen a defect. Yeah. How does that yeah, kind if of you keep, Yeah, if you, keep, if you keep going out and not finding anything, you know, that's fine. That means, you're, that means your frequency is too close. You know, so every, every third time you go out and do an inspection, you should see something. That's typically the way it works. That's it's it's a it's just three times. That's that's the typical general rule. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. One more question here. It says, are you familiar with a software to help you control PMs? Um, all CMMSs should do that if they're set up yeah. correctly. Maximo is probably the best one for it. Working with a company right now on that. You know, we're having some problems with it, but we're um we're working now. Let's put it that way. 
what about a software software for operator care? Do you know of any? I mean, I'd, I'd use the, the CMMS because if operator care is really dealing with asset care, and that's really the whole thing is process and asset reliability, I'd put it in the mm -hmm. same CMMS. Why not? Mm -hmm. Better communication. Think, think about this. If you got the data come from operators and maintenance to the same, to the same asset, you're going to learn a lot from that. It's a great, great question. We just got another one, and I apologize. It was further up, and I missed it. Um, uh, another one says, we have a lot of Fin fans, and there is a PM for them, greasing only. But corrective maintenance is still high, and it seems to not be helping. Any idea on how we can overcome this issue? Say that one more time. Sure. We have a lot of Fin fans, and there's a PM for them, greasing only. But corrective maintenance is still high, and it seems to not be helping. How can yeah. we overcome? this issue there's a there's a paper you can google called doing too much pm but you could be doing too much pm but are you focused on the parts on that those assets that's what you're looking for. break it down to the part level and say how does that part fail that's what you should so if you got a fan the blowers having problems with break it down to the parts you know what is failing how often are they failing why are they failing do a root cause analysis on them and you can figure it out and most of the time if you use the five whys you'll solve that problem but if you want to send me an email, you know, my email address is right here, rsmith at worldclassmaintenance.org. Just give me more information. I'll be glad to, to help you out. We have one more question. Uh, one more question here. It says, what is the advantage of determining reliability when a PM program exists? What's the advantage of measuring reliability when a corrective maintenance program exists? For reliability, the number one measure of reliability is mean time between failure. So if mean time between failure, how are you going to measure mean time between failure? Just number of failures divided into time. That's all that is. It's not it's not complicated. You can send me an email if I didn't give you a clear enough answer on it, I'll be glad to help you with it. Just give me more details. Awesome. Um, well, I think that's all of our questions for today. Thank you, Ricky, for a, a great presentation. I saw some comments in the chat. Everyone was really learning a lot. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your awesome questions and a great discussion here at the end. Um, I will see everyone next time, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.